Okay, we're trying to get back to some kind of normalcy. Uh, two years ago, I uh, hosted a uh, guys' night out. You know, instead of the mother-daughter events, we're having something for the guys. So father, son, you know, grandson, nephew. It's just a guys' night out. We're going to camp out in the woods at my place. It'll be Friday night into Saturday. We'll get up. We'll have breakfast, maybe a light lunch, and then everybody packs up and goes home. You know, it's a good time to, to try to get everybody re reunited again. We can do social distancing and still be together and have a good night out with a campfire, hot dogs, marshmallows. So, and there, there won't be any cost in it. We're just going to, somebody's going to bring, you know, a bag of marshmallows. Somebody will go bring some graham crackers, maybe we'll make some s'mores. We'll just have a good night and uh, have a good time. So that's going to be on the 18th into the 19th. It's Father's Day weekend. It is Friday night into Saturday. So I'll have a sign-up sheet out there next week. So as many of you that can come, I'd love to have you. Thank you. And that is all our announcements for today. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, we read this, and I think this fits in with the sermon that we're going to have this morning. I don't know, because I haven't heard it yet. But this is 1 Timothy chapter 1, and this is what we read. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And isn't that what it's all about? That's the reason why he came. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have not left us on our own, that you saw us in our sin, and you knew that we couldn't save ourselves. So you were gracious to us, and you sent your son to die for us. Thank you so much for that. We will be eternally grateful. Thank you that you sent your son into this world to save sinners. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Happy sunny Sunday. In Ephesians 2 we read, Once we were dead because of our disobedience and many sins, but our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when we, he raised Christ from the dead. And then in Romans 8, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because we belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed us from the power of sin. All right, so we're gonna stand and if you will, we're gonna sing a song about, maybe not all of us, but all of us that have been saved some of us are more radically saved than others, but this is a song about that glorious day when we all met the Lord. And some of us came from different places when we reached our salvation. Let's sing this. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. On my failures as I tried to hide. It was my tomb.
Pentecost Sunday. How many know that today's Pentecost Sunday? It was on my calendar at work. And it's, it's not even a religious calendar, but it, today's Pentecost. And you know, the, the thing about Pentecost is um, a lot of things. And it's, it actually comes from Acts chapter 2, which I'm going to read just a couple verses from. But that was the start of the Christian church, was at Pentecost. And if you, uh, if you read, read, read Acts chapter 2 sometimes, it's pretty cool. It's interesting, but I'm just going to read a little bit of it. And they were talking about their, their conversion experience, and it said, for those who welcomed the message of, of, that Christ was putting out, they were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. And they were they devoted. Now listen, this is, the, this is the cool part from here to the end. And this is something that, think about this church, our church, and, and how maybe how we need to get to, to where this, this was in the beginning and how, how the church was in the beginning. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread. It's one of my favorites right there. They, they were eating together, fellowshipping, and, and, to, and, to, the, and to the prayers. And, and the prayer. All came upon everyone because of the many sign, signs and wonders. If you remember, they, they actually had them speaking in different languages so that every, every nation and, and everybody could understand the, the gospel message, the message of Christ. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all who had need. How about that? That's, that's a lot. We have a lot of things that we own. You can't have my iPhone. But you know, what if I had two of them? The Bible says, let he who has two give to he who has none. And so, and uh, anyway, day by day as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread, again, at home, probably with each other, ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having goodwill of all the people. And, and day by day, the Lord added to their numbers those who were being saved. Let's think about that and let's think about how, how maybe, hopefully, God will do that again here in this church. That's the song, Do It Again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me.
As always, if, if you feel like you're standing too long, you're always welcome to sit. Um, when you stand, I, you sound like a choir. You sound amazing to up here. You really do. Um, but we're going to sing one more song, and it's not a real long one. So There it is. Now, I was thinking on the way up here, what a privilege it is that I had the opportunity to come to spend time with the Lord here. And each one of us here has that same opportunity. If you haven't spent any time thinking about what that means, you've got to spend some time uh, doing that. And I look out and I see a bunch of people here today. And it was a, a gorgeous day. So you could be out there fishing, laying in a hammock. There's lots of things you could be doing. But you made the choice to come here and worship our Lord and Savior. 
and there's no, nothing you could be doing that's a better uh, way to spend this time. Uh, so I'm just thankful for that. Before we go to prayer, I have uh, at least one addition. Well, I have two additions here. One is uh, Barb Stegmeyer. Poor Barb has been dealing with a lot of stuff, but now she fell and broke a bone in her upper arm. She is in a lot of pain. She's not going to need surgery, but it's going to be a long recovery time. So that means she's going to be dealing with pain for, for quite a while. Uh, so keep her in prayer for that. The other one is Ann German. We all know Ann German. Uh, she has a urinary tract infection, and because of the issues that she's had health-wise, it's a hard time to find something that's going to work uh, to get rid of that, uh, you know, that, that issue. So she is in Lehigh Valley Hospital right now on, uh, on IV antibiotic, and, and that is, uh, as far as I understand, that is starting to work. So would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you just so incredibly thankful that you not only allow us to come before you, but, but you really enjoy that time we spend with you. You relish that relationship that we develop. And Father, you have just a love for us that we, we really can't even come close to understanding. Your desire is that we would all spend time with you. Your desire is that none would perish, that every person on this earth would come to... Uh, Come to an understanding that, that you are the only way to heaven. You are the only one that can, that can give us salvation. And Father, you are the great healer. You are in charge. And Lord, as I look around at what's taking place in this world, it's, it's easy to start getting down until we realize that you truly are in charge. Lord, we just thank you. And we hang on to that. And we thank you for the peace that that gives us. And Father, right now we... Uh, look at some of the people that we have on the prayer list here, Lord. We do ask for a relief from pain for Barb Stigma. Lord, it's a, it could be a, a long, tough road. She's dealt with a lot already, but, and we know that she hangs on to you, Father. So we just ask that you would touch her body and make that pain just a, a, bare, a bare minimum to allow her to get through there. And for Ann Gurman, Lord, we pray that you would just uh, uh, bring her home shortly. Lord, uh, allow that that medication to do the, do the trick. And Lord, I pray that her body would do the rest, that uh, she would come back to her health and she can come back to her home very shortly. And Father, we look at Peter Klingerman, who I don't know, but Lord, you know absolutely every part about him. And Lord, he has a rare, aggressive form of kidney cancer. God, I know he is just, he's just, uh, I'll just use the word beside himself, Lord, with, with, with wonder, with, with worry, with, uh, you know, doubts about the future. But, Father, we pray that the chemo that the doctor is going to give him would eliminate that. And we know that that chemo won't work without, without your blessing, without your hand. So we pray, Father, that your hand would, would be upon him and he would come through this and he would know that the healing comes, comes from you. And, Father, we look at Dave Marks, all he has meant to this church, how faithful he has served this church. And he has just come under a long period of uh, attacks, a long period of physical issues. And Lord, now we add this to, to that, Lord, that his, his vocal cord uh, is, is paralyzed. And Father, we, we know that there is going to be an injection uh, uh, to help somewhat. But as I talked to Dave Gibson, it looks like it's going to be a, a long road and that this may not actually help right away. They may have to do some type of surgery to restore that. Lord, so I just pray for, for Dave, that he just feels now that we as a church are praying for him, that, that he knows that we love him as, as you love him, Lord. And we pray that we can have that time to look forward to when he'll be back here, when he'll be playing that bass, Father. And we thank you for that. Uh, Lord, we look at Tracy Drogas, and uh, we pray that things will go well there. Lord, again, that you're involved. Same for Gabe, Father. Uh, we know that his one chemo was, was uh, changed. But, Lord, we pray that when that takes place also that that will make a big difference. And, Father, we pray for healing for Carol Taylor's dad, Fred Hardman. Lord, again, help him to see your face. And for Pam Hunsucker, we pray as we continue in prayer, in prayer for her that, that she can get that kidney that she so desperately needs. 
And Lord, as we look at Art's mom, she's dealing with cancer, and we pray that that is gone, that the biopsy shows, shows no, none any, no, uh, no cancer anymore. And Father, as I talked to Tanya today, she's still in pain from that cyst in her neck, and we pray for a, just a relief from that pain, because as I talked to her, I found that there's not going to be anything done for a little while. So we pray that you could relieve that pain. And Lord, we, we look at Chrissy St. Clair, another person that we don't know, but again, Father, you know. And she's been diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, a, a horrible disease. Father, we just pray that, that you, would, you would take a step to remove that from her body. That's our desire, that you would, you would actually perform a miracle there. But if that doesn't happen, if that's not your will, then we just pray that you give her peace. You help her to hang on to you and that you, Lord, would show, show your face to her. Father, as I, as, I, as I think about our church, I just pray that you would bless us to be a blessing for the, the world out there. Father, I ask that you would use us in a special way uh, to help people who don't know you. Father, we're here as brothers and sisters uh, who are called your, your kids, your sons and daughters. But so many people out there don't, don't have that blessing. Father, we know where we're going once we pass away. And those people so many times don't know where they're going, but, but we do. So, Father, use this church in whatever way you cho choose to make a difference in the lives of people here and, and around the world. And, Lord, as we look at our country, we do see some, some things happening that are moving away from you and from your will. And yet, Lord, we know that you are in charge. Father, help us to be in prayer that you would take this country and this situation we're dealing with it and even turn that into a positive. We know that Romans 8.28 says that you can take anything that happens and you can turn it for good. So Father, we, uh, we just thank you for that. And Lord, we know as we think about the money we're giving to this church, we're giving to you, Father, help us to understand that you're not asking us to give 10% of what is ours. You are honestly asking us to keep 90% of what really isn't ours. It's all yours. So, Father, we just thank you for all these things in Jesus' name, and we pray that you would bless the, the message that comes after this and that you would just give us the open hearts and open minds to be able to, to hear and to make the changes uh, that your Holy Spirit will make. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you've been looking at your worship folder or not, but uh, under upcoming birthdays, there's one today. Shirley Knappenberger, happy birthday. There's also several others coming up this week. David Gibson, uh, Donna White, and Dorothy Getz, uh, and Barb uh, Stegmeyers is coming up fairly soon too. But. Uh, uh, also want to just uh, say Kathy and I had a, a great week away at the beach and uh, yes, a week is not long enough at the ocean. You know, I could live there. I can actually breathe there. All my sinus issues go away, but it was great and it's great to be back with you today and to uh, continue our journey together to see what God uh, wants to do in and through us as a church body. Well, in the book entitled Eternal, Externally Focused Church, Rick Russell and Eric Swanson tells a story about a number of years ago, while speaking to a group, a small group of pastors, Chuck Colson commented about uh, attending a national prayer breakfast uh, some time ago. And uh, Colson said the room was full of powerful people. The president of the U.S., the congressmen, uh, many senators, leaders of industry and heads of state were all in attendance. But he said it was interesting to note the most powerful person in the room had no title, was small in stature, and had very few financial resources. But when she spoke, 
even presidents listened. Mother Teresa's power stemmed not from position or from title or from wealth, but as in her role as being a servant. She had learn, earned the right to be heard through a lifetime of service. No one would argue that Christians shouldn't serve. When Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, he said, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. We are to serve one another. The early church followed his example and turned the world upside down. Loving acts of service is and should be the one identifying mark of Christians and the church. But unfortunately, every statistic tells us that the church is losing influence and becoming more and more marginalized. We actually don't need another Barna study to point that out. And there are many reasons for this, but perhaps three come to mind. First of all, as messengers, Christians have a difficult task, not because the message isn't compelling, but because oftentimes we are not compelling messengers. The world is no longer scandalized when Christian leaders fall. They come to, have come to expect it. Second, we have to tell the truth to a world that no longer believes in truth, that there is truth. John Bruce, a pastor at Creekside Community Church in California, describes this dilemma in this way. He says, For so many years I felt that my evangelism was like presenting my case before a jury, but the judge wouldn't allow me to present any evidence. Other pastors have said, It used to be that as a, a church felt like you were on your, trying to share the gospel with your, in your community that you were, had the home team advantage. But he says, that doesn't feel that way anymore. Thirdly, he says, churches like organizations drift from their mission and become inwardly focused on their own needs and consumed with, with creating elaborate structures so that their own needs are met. That was the case with Israel. They were to be a light to the nations, but instead of focusing on being a light to the nations, they became very inward and focused on all the rules and regulations that made you a good Jew or not. But Jesus cut through all that. And he said, let's keep it simple. We are to love God, love others, and help others love God. And the last two messages I shared with you were on that subject. But that last part, to help others love God, is what the Great Commission is all about. That through our words and through our deeds, we are to reach out to others with the love of Jesus. Mother Teresa's influence came from her life of sacrificially serving others. And if we want to make an impact on our community, if we want to be effective at helping others to love God, then they must see that we truly love God and we truly love others. To tell the truth, we must show the truth. Honest, compassionate service can restore credibility to us as messengers and to our message. It's the model that Jesus used. He served. He loved. And he was, and he met people's needs. And people listened to him. Aaron McManus, a pastor of Mosaic in Los Angeles, stated this simple yet powerful truth about sharing the gospel message today. He said, people have given up on truth because they don't believe anyone can be trusted. The world is full of people who have been hurt by those who are supposed to love them. 
people that they should have been able to trust. And before the church will be heard, we must establish trust. And to establish trust, we must serve and love just like Jesus did. To paraphrase Andy Stanley, he said, when people are convinced you want something for them rather than something from them, then they will truly know that you love them. I had a professor, a theology professor in seminary, they say that unfortunately many churches are known for what they're against more than what they are for. And that's not giving the whole truth. When people are convinced you want something for them rather than something from them, they will then know that you truly love them. At times we talk about service, but how do we really effectively meet the needs of the people in our community? Are we willing to step outside the comfort zone and the safety of our gathering with like-minded believers and walk across the street and step into the reality of other people and their hurts and their pain and their distrust and wash their feet and care for their needs? Our lives must follow the example of Christ, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's why Jesus came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to, to give his life for us. The mission of the church is the Great Commission, helping others to love God. Jesus commanded, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We've expressed our church's mission this way, to know God, to know Christ, and to make him known, or to reach and to disciple others for Christ, or in other words, to love God, to love others, and help others to love God. That's what we're called to do. Today, I want us to consider the various components of the Great Commission. I covered some of this in the Creating a New Life Cycle for, and Becoming Outwardly Focused seminar uh, three weeks ago. Uh, Saturday night, but each one of these components is vital for, to fulfill the mission that God has given to us. The first one is that of outreach. It's the going. And the scriptures tell us, therefore go, or therefore be going. It's a participle, but it takes the form of a command off of the main verb, which is to make disciples. And so Jesus is telling us to go, to be going, or as you are going, you are to be making disciples. I find it interesting that we're never found in Scripture where unbelievers are commanded to come to the church. But the church is commanded over and over again to go out into the world and make disciples. The outreach is showing Christ's love. It's doing good works that produce goodwill that will give opportunity to the good to share the good news. Evangelism is that making disciples, the main command in this passage in Matthew 28, that we are commanded to make disciples of all nations. That's sharing God's love, declaring the good news, and then equipping. We are to be baptizing and teaching them to obey everything. That is growing in God's love, helping people to grow up into God's love. That's developing God's people. Remember show and tell back maybe in first grade? Both showing and telling were important. You had to do both, not only show, but also tell about what you were showing. 
it seems as though some Christians today are only concerned about showing God's love and they'll, they'll, they'll never speak a word of God's love and grace or the need of salvation. And others are all about telling, telling about God's love or telling you need to repent but not showing God's love in very tangible ways. And unfortunately, sometimes what they do show doesn't match up with what they're telling. Whether we like it or not, we need to earn the right to be heard in the marketplace today. And as we've heard so many times, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So showing God's love through serving others can help believers and churches tell the good news more effectively. The success of an outwardly focused church depends on getting involved in the community, creating authentic relationships, and being truly useful. In the process of showing God's love, outwardly focused churches have discovered again and again that people are more willing to listen to their message. When people are convinced that you want something for them rather than something from them, they'll know that you really love them and they'll be ready to listen. Oftentimes the words outreach and evangelism are used interchangeably, meaning the same thing. But today I'm using them as two separate and unique things, not as interchangeable terms. Outreach is just as the name re uh, implies, reaching out to others. Evangelism is the communication of the good news in, con in conversation with others. Outreach without evangelism is incomplete. It doesn't go far enough. It doesn't tell the story. People can't find Jesus as their Savior by just seeing how much you love them. But evangelism without outreach is ineffective because they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. <clears throat> but both together, when they're practiced together, good works pro produces good will, giving opportunity for the good news. Good works produce good will, giving opportunity for the good news. That quote came from Bayside Church of Granite Bay. To be, we need to be good news before we tell the good news. When people are convinced that you want something for them rather than something from them, they will listen to your message. And each part of the disciple-making process is linked to the other. Outreach leads to evangelism. Evangelism hopefully leads to people coming to faith in Christ, and then we need to grow them up so that they will, will know and love Jesus. And then when they become more like Jesus, they'll become outwardly focused because that's who Jesus was. He was a friend of sinners. And when we're like Jesus, when we're most like Jesus, it's when we are laying down our lives for those who don't know Jesus. And when we are consumed with our own preferences, with our own ideas, with our own comfort, before helping others come to know Jesus, we're not like Jesus. We're not being like Jesus. We're not being like the man who died on the cross. We're being like the evil one who's only concerned about himself. When we're like Jesus, we lay down our lives, we lay down our preferences, we lay down our concerns, and we focus upon showing and sharing the love of Jesus. When we are mature believers, we will be focused outward. When we fight and devour and complain and bite one another, we cannot claim to be mature believers. We are acting like the world, not like the one who gave his life for us. Outreach 
leads to evangelism, an opportunity to share Christ. Evangelism leads to new disciples who need to grow and to be developed. And as they grow and develop, they become like Jesus and reach out to others. Ed Stetzer says, change people become change agents and should no longer live for themselves. In Scripture, we see all three of these aspects of the Great Commission are of great importance. Outreach. Let's look at a couple of verses quickly here. It's the going, the showing, the love of Christ. It's the doing of good works. And Matthew chapter 5, 16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your what? Good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Acts 2. Already was read to us this morning. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Each day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The first part of this passage, we see the church in Jerusalem being good news. They were good news to the community. They were selling their possessions and goods and they gave to anyone that had need, which led then to opportunity to share the good news. They were enjoying the favor of all the people. Good works produce goodwill that gives opportunity for the good news, which leads to the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. All three are important. Their good works led to goodwill which led to the good news being shared. In Acts chapter 10, Peter in his message summarizes the life of Jesus. He says, you know what happened throughout the province of, of, of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all those who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Peter summarized Jesus' life as being filled with the Holy Spirit, and he went around doing good and healing many others. 1 Peter chapter 2, live such a good life, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Outreach without evangelism, however, is incomplete. And evangelism is the sharing, the proclamation, the declaring of the good news. It's the sowing of gospel seeds. It's, it's sharing how Jesus loved people and came to give their life for them. It's reaping the harvest. In Mark chapter 13, we read, the gospel must first be preached to all nations. And then as we heard this morning about today being Pentecost, well, Jesus predicted Pentecost in Acts 1-8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. When we have the Holy Spirit's power in our lives, we will be his witnesses. If we're not his witnesses, guess what? That must mean we don't have the power of the Spirit in our lives. We just looked at Peter's sermon that when Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, he went around doing good. The Spirit of God's going to produce in us a desire to serve others and to be his witness. And if we're not experiencing that in some way, shape, or form, then we need to do a heart check and see where the Holy Spirit is in our lives. Have we given him control? Are we yielding to him? Or are we simply living our lives the way we want to live? It's 
2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. This is an amazing passage. Paul says we are Christ's ambassadors, that, that we are representing Jesus Christ to the world around us. And God is making his appeal through us. What a privilege. What a privilege to be used of God to make his appeal. And so we implore people to be reconciled to God. Colossians chapter 2. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too. Now, what does Paul ask him, ask the believers in Colossae to pray for? Pray that God may open the door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer anyone or answer everyone. I thought, boy, if the Apostle Paul, the great church planter and evangelist, needed uh, other believers to be praying for him that he would be effective and would have a door of opportunity to share the gospel, then boy, we better get on our knees and be praying for us that God would open the doors and that we would proclaim the message clearly. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, but in your heart set apart, Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Outreach gives opportunity for evangelism, which leads to new birth and the need then to equip people, believers, to grow in Christ. And that's the third part, the equipping, baptizing, and teaching them to obey everything. Making disciples includes all three components the outreach, the evangelism, and the equipping. It's developing God's people, feeding and caring for the newborn babe in Christ. It's teaching them how to care for themselves and others and reproducing that process in other people. Unfortunately, many churches act as though newborn believers will automatically grow on their own with little help from the church rather than having a simple, intentional process to help disciple people to full maturity in Christ. But we can't give spiritual birth to a newborn babe in Christ and then set them free to go off on their own. You wouldn't do that to an infant. Well, not if you're a normal person, you wouldn't. And so we too as a church need to have a simple, intentional process to equip people. Second Peter chapter 3 says, Grow in the grace of the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are to grow. We, we don't become a believer in Christ as a ticket to heaven, as a fire escape. We are to, we come to, to Jesus as our Savior, then to become transformed into his image. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 18 says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness. That's God's goal for you, to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus with ever-increasing glory which comes from this Lord who is the Spirit. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. God wants you and me to grow to reflect Jesus Christ. As believers grow to maturity and become like Christ, We will become outward focused, and the cycle continues. Outreach, evangelism, and equipping 
All three are important in making disciples. But there's one more important ingredient that pulls all three together that are important to all three, and that is relationships. Relationships are the key to all three of these components of disciple making. Outreach, evangelism, and equipping the saints for ministry will only be done well in the context of authentic relationships. Authentic, meaningful relationships. Luke chapter 10 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your and with all your mind, and love your neighbors yourself. Love is the key. Relationships are the key. John 13, a new command I give you, Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. Not only love your neighbors yourself, now Jesus ups the ante quite a bit. We're not only to love one another as we love ourselves, but we are to love one another just like Jesus loved us as we lay down our lives for one another. By, all, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have a nice church sign out front. By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have a great website on the internet. By this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you, that you are truly one of my followers, if you love one another like I loved you. Rick Warren says three things drew people to Jesus. He loved them, he met their needs, and he taught them in interesting and practical ways. Jesus loved lost people and loved spending time with them. That's why he was called a friend of the tax collectors and sinners. We'll be more like Jesus when we love the tax collectors and sinners and become known as a friend of sinners. Jesus didn't spend time with them because they were his project. Jesus spent time with them because he loved them. That's why he came to this world, was to love them and to share the good news with them. Ma Matthew chapter 9 talks about how when Jesus went through the town and the villages, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the good news. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a, a, a shepherd. That same kind of love needs, will beat in our hearts when the Holy Spirit has full control of us. Christians need to be, do, and tell the good news. The scriptures are clear. That's our mission. Our vision is to be an agent of, trans, of a transformation in the community. Fellowship Bible Church in Little Rock, Arkansas was a large, successful church by every measure that people might use, but they were still rather inwardly focused. In the first 10 years, this church experienced stellar growth. They had 3,500 people in attendance. In 10 years, went from zero to 3,500. Pretty good. And they planted 15 other churches in the process. Why? Wow. Just about everyone that would study churches would say, that's very impressive. But listen to what the pastor, Robert Lewis, says. But even with all of our advances over 10 years, we were still little more than a stranger in our community. Honestly, the larger we became, the more preoccupied we had become with ourselves. It would be hard to imagine that this was the design Jesus had in mind when he dreamed of his church. He goes on, he says, at a leadership retreat where they were assessing their church, someone raised a haunting question. They asked, is our church, is our community rather, is our community really being changed? Because we are here as a church, is our community really being changed? Was our success mostly an internal barometer or a penetrating reality? 
And in the wake of the reflections and the comments that followed as they discussed trying to answer this question, is our community really being changed? Someone read the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. He said it was like a floodgate was lifted. On the wings of a holy moment, he says, launched, the, the reading, launched by the reading of a single verse of Scripture, a greater vision took air. We all hungered in that moment to be a church that incarnated or lived out the gospel so well and so effectively in our city that rather than scoffing or ridiculing our proclamation or even worse, ignoring us altogether, it would instead, because of our good works, literally they would feel compelled to give praise to God. Now that's a vision that we would so impact the community around us that they would not ignore our existence, but that because of our love and good deeds, they would be compelled to praise God for us. It's so easy for us to become accustomed to the way things are, that we don't see the possibilities of what the Lord wants, how he wants to use us. Rick Russo tells a story about how his daughter went to an optometrist for a checkup. And that night she said, oh, Dad, I can see so much better. And it wasn't that she needed new glasses, but the automat optometrist discovered that inadvertently she had switched her contacts that the contact that was supposed to be in her right ear, eye, I almost said ear, right eye was in her left eye and vice versa. And her dad said, well, didn't it bother you? And she said, well, yeah, at first, a little bit, but then after a while, I kind of got used to it. And that's how it is. We know things aren't quite right, but we kind of get used to it. And we accept the status quo as being normal. The way we look at the world, or the way we are approaching things, we know it's just a little bit off, but after a while we kind of get used to doing it that way. And we kind of think it's normal. We began to think that's the way things are supposed to be. But God invites us to look through his lenses and to begin to see things clearly. And as one of my friends used to say, when what is normative in the church from God's perspective, isn't normal for us as a church. Who needs to change? We might think it's normal. We might think it's okay. But if we're not doing what God says we need to be doing, who needs to change? You pray with me. Father, we've become accustomed to life as we've come to know it. And Lord, I ask that you would give us the desire to see things wholly and completely from your perspective. Lord, forgive us for living for ourselves instead of living for you.
Father, we need your spirit to do a work in our hearts, to see this world the way you do, and to love it like Jesus did. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Be ready, always be prepared to, to give a reason for the hope that we have. And um, stand with us as we sing this last song. It's called Living Hope. Jesus Christ is our living hope. Let's sing that.
Hallelujah. We praise you, Father, because you're the one who set us free through Jesus. Jesus, yours is the victory, our living hope. How, how grateful we are, Lord. And thank you, Father, that you use us to accomplish your will and purposes here. And so may the God who is able to make all grace abound toward you so that at all time, in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Father, may others need to give you praise because of the light that is shining through us and our good deeds. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.